So there's often times where we want to deal with a discrete variable. And this discrete variable is very going to be binomially dis, um, distributed such that, hey, we have successes, we have failures, but we have something like 500 trials that we want to run. And we're interested in, hey, what's the probability that we have more than 400 successes and 500 trials? And sure, we could go through and we could compute this with our binomial distribution. I mean, with computers, this isn't actually unrealistic or terrible, but there's actually a much easier way. What we can do is we can actually approximate this binomial distribution with our normal distribution in order to get a much more rapid response with much less computing power or brain power being utilized for this. So let's take a look at how we can do this and let's take a look at why this works. Let's uh, jump over and begin to take a look. So to start, let's take a look at our binomial. So if we have a binomial distribution, uh, let's get a right color here. If we have a binomial distribution, so for X, and if we have a large enough mean, so typically speaking, we're gonna say that if, if NP and NQ, if both of these guys are greater than five, we can approximate. So, okay, if that's the case, we can approximate our binomial with a normal. Keeping in mind, N would be our number of trials, P is the probability of success, Q is the probability of failure. So one minus P is what that guy there is. So in this case, if we were to take a look at our binomial, let's say we had something where n equals 12 with a p of 0.5. This would work, right? And even this would be small enough that we could calculate this with our binomial as well. n of 12, probability of 0.5, that would give us six, that would give us six. Hey, we're good to go, we've met this condition. If we were to take a look at how this binomial would look, if we created the histogram of it, it would have something uh, along these lines. So if we went along all the way from zero up to on the other extreme here, we had 12, what if we cut this in the middle here? That would be six, let's cut in the middle again. We have three and I can go one, two, four, five, cut in the middle again, nine, seven, eight, 10, 11. What I get with my binomial, for n equals 12, p equals 0 0.5, is I'm gonna get a bar chart that looks something along these lines, right? And you can, you can graph this yourself, you can check. You can throw this into Excel, you can say, okay, for x from zero to 12, what's my probability of success? And go through it in that way. For zero, uh, we get zero. For one, uh, we get just a little guy. Then we get a little bit more, just freehanding this. I'm not really worried about what the true height works out to. At three, we get just over, and there we go. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Where again, the height of this is the probability of x. Well, what we should notice in this is that yes, this is a discrete distribution, right? And hence why we just have these boxes with it. But what we should notice is that this actually looks pretty similar to what we said our normal distribution is. That is, if we overlaid this with a normal, we would get something that looks like this. And so in this way here, we can actually approximate our binomial results just by utilizing our normal, converting x to a z and finding out the probability underneath. Now, okay, mind you, with an n of 12, it's probably gonna be easier just to use the binomial in some cases, but if we had in instead an n of 120, an n of 1200, well, now all of a sudden the normal becomes a bit easier to use. If we take a look at this normal, it's gonna have a mean right at, six, which keep in mind, right, this was the mean of our binomial as well, mean of the binomial. 
mean of a binomial is just n times p. So the normal shares the binomial's mean. And then what about the standard deviation of this? Standard deviation of x. Well, standard deviation of x is going to be, again, because we're approximating the binomial, our yellow normal is lining up right on top. Standard deviation is going to be one and the same as the standard deviation of that binomial. So that was the square root of n times p times q. So number of trials, probability of success, probability of failure. Take the square root of all that. That's going to be our standard deviation. So what do we get here? n times p? Well, we worked out that. Uh, this guy here, n times p is 6, times probability of failure, 50%, that's 3. What's the square root of 3? 1.732. Okay, so we have our mean, we have our standard deviation. Next, what we need to do is if we want to say, let's work through an example here. Let's suppose that we wanted to know, we wanted to know, let's just get rid of this. Let's make some room here. We have our condition met, NP and Q are both greater than five. Say we wanted to determine what is the probability that we witness eight or more successes. So probability that X is greater than eight. Well, we could go through our binomial and we could just calculate this using our binomial. And we'll cheat a little bit here. I'll give you what that result would be. So just using our binomial, we could work out probability that x is greater than or equal to 8 to be 0 0.1938. So a 19.38% chance that we witness 8 or more. Right, keeping in mind what that is, is we'd be taking this box here, that box there, box, box, adding all of those up. So probability that x is 8, probability that x is 9, probability that x is 10, probability that x is 11. Add all those up and we get 0.1938. Cool. Well, what we can also do is we can use our normal to approximate this. And what we need to do if we want to use our normal to approximate this is we actually have to change things a little bit. And let's take a look at why. Same question, probability that x is greater than or equal to 8. So look, if I just draw 8 up and say all of this, well, look at this, right? I have now excluded this part of this box of 8. And so as a result, I'm going to have a problem. I'm not going to have a correct amount of my approximation. So in order to correct that, what I need to do is I need to not go, right, so probability that x is greater than 8, that's not going to work. What I need to actually do is I need to back up a little bit here, and I need to go from right here, right, from right there, and go, okay, what's all this here? And if I do that, well, hey, that's between 7 and 8. So that is a value of 7.5 or bigger. And so what I'm actually interested in this case here is, hey, what's the probability that x is greater than 7.5? I have to make this adjustment. And this here would be known as our continuity correction factor. And we would have to make this continuity correction factor any and every time we are trying to approximate the binomial with the normal. And it's just due to the fact that, hey, this 8 would be lined up in the middle versus we want it to be just that 7.5 or bigger so we get the whole box. So let's work through, let's compare our approximation to our actual value that we calculated. So to do that, well, first thing, right, we can't deal with x's directly. We have to compare this. We have to, sorry, not compare this. We need to adjust this from an x to a z, transform it from an x to a z. So that is that 7.5 is going to come down and become some z value. 6, that'll come down and become a 0. So let's work that out. z is going to be my x value of interest, 7.5, minus my mean of 6, 
all over standard deviation of 1.732. So what is that? Uh, 7.5 minus 6 is 1.5 divided by 1.732. I get 0 0.8. 866. So, okay, keep in mind our Z table only goes to two decimal places. So, I'm going to go 0 0.87. 0 0.87, that's my Z statistic. What I now want to do is I want to go to my table. Keep in mind my table is going to give me the probability between this Z score and 0. So, doing that. So we're doing that, going down 0 0.8 on the left side across to 7, we get a probability of 0 0.3078. Keeping in mind again, that's our probability between our z-score and 0. We are looking for between there and infinity. So how do we get that? Well, between 0 and infinity, is 50%. So we do 50% minus our probability, so 0.5 minus, and we get our guy here as 0 0.1922. So we'd get this yellow bit. Our normal approximation of the binomial is 19.22%. Hey, take a look. That's not so bad given an approximation. The bigger the value of n, the bigger ultimately the value that np and nq are. As these guys get bigger, this gets more and more exact. If one of these or both of these are really close to our condition of np, nq greater than 5, as we are here, right? We had 6 for our value. The closer we are to 5, the more kind of fuzz, the more of an approximation it is. The bigger these values are, the better result we get. So going through it, ultimately, we can take a binomial. We can find the mean, NP, use that as the mean of our, right? Say, hey, X is approximately normal with a mean of NP and a variance of NPQ. As long as our conditions are met, we can say, cool, that's the case. Then from there, we can go and we can work out probability underneath the curve, just as we did with our normal situation. We just have to be sure to apply our continuity correction factors. That is, what we'd have to do is, depending on what we're looking for, we would have to either go plus or minus 0.5 from what we're looking for. So, for example, in our case, we said, hey, probability that x is greater than or including 8. So that was 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. Had we instead said, hey, what's the probability that x is just greater than 8? So that is probability that x was 9, 10, 11, 12. Well, in that case, that would have been 9, 10, 11, right? The blue parts here that I'm shading in. I know it's getting really over overlapping each other. Okay, keep in mind that because I'm saying greater than 8, I'm not including 8. My cutoff point would now be right here, right? In that case there, I would have used 8.5. I would have added a 0.5 when I was doing my 8.5 down to my Z. So I'm always going to be doing some kind of plus or minus 0.5 in order to get my continuity correction factor. Best way that I find is just to kind of think about it in this way. Then you don't make any mistakes. Of course, there is a table that we can utilize, um, kind of that we can pull up and take a look at in order to make sure, in order to help us to kind of keep things straight. And let's take a look at that. Okay, so what we have here is we have our table kind of outlining for an x equals 6 kind of situation, how we would do this continuity correction factor. So that is if we had our binomial case, our discrete case, and we said, hey, we want to know what is the probability that x equals 6. That is x equals 6. So just this box here. Well, okay, 
what we could do is we could use a continuity correction factor to figure that out. And that is by realizing, okay, what we'd have to do is we would have to cut this to be 5.5 to 6.5, right? And by working that out, 5.5 to 6.5, we could very similarly convert to a Z and then find the area between those two. Carrying down, we have all of our different situations. So just greater than six, well, that's like what we looked at when we said, hey, greater than eight, we would have to cut from 6.5 onwards because we wouldn't include six. Greater than or equal to six, well, we'd want to include six. So we'd go down to 5.5 and we'd go six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then very similarly, going back the other way, if we said, hey, x is less than or equal to 6, again, we want to include 6, so we'd want to include all this. We'd go 6.5 or less versus less than 6. We don't want to include 6, so we'd just be going right here from the 5.5 lower. So ultimately, it really all comes back to this idea here as to where our binomial fits with relation to this continuous and the fact that we need to do that plus or minus 0.5 in order to align things. Hopefully that helps to kind of see how this all fits together. Uh, what we'll do for the rest of this video is just take a look at a few examples of actually working through this binomial approximation of the normal. Okay, so here we're gonna work through some examples of approximating our binomial with the normal. To be honest, once we know what we're doing, it's fairly easy, right? It's like, okay, I know what tool to use on the toolbox, I just gotta follow through the steps. I shouldn't say easy, but right, we know the steps, we can just power through it. The big difficulty, especially as we go on this course, is figuring out what tool to pull from the toolbox. That is, am I doing the normal approximation of the binomial, or am I just doing the normal? Right, and that's the big difficulty, is discerning which one am I utilizing. So what we need to do is we need to take a look at our data, and we need to discern, are we dealing with discrete data, or are we dealing with continuous data? So let's keep that in mind as we approach this question. So what do we have? A study recently released suggests that 3 in 10 Canadians have a debt to disposable income ratio over 200%. If we were wanting to test this, sampling 500 Canadians at random, what is the probability that more than 140 of these Canadians have a debt to disposable income ratio of over 200%? Okay. So looking at this, this is really set up as a binomial question, and that should really be our good hint that we are approximating the binomial here. Number of Canadians, right? You count how many people, you don't measure them. So by counting how many people, what's the probability of more than 140 people, we are dealing with a discrete random variable. So that's our good hint here, discrete. So we're going to be approximating the binomial, right? As we go through this, we would want to identify as well Okay, we are pulling out a sample size of 500. We are saying that one in, um, sorry, that three in 10 Canadians. So that is 30% of Canadians have a debt to disposable income ratio of over 200%. And then we want to know, hey, what is the probability that we have more than 140? So X is greater than 140. That is, right, if we were adding it up, we would be adding up probability that x is 141, probability that x is 142, on, 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 all the way up to x equals 500, right? We'd be adding up each of these individuals if we did that through the binomial fashion, which would be pretty problematic. So, okay, that'd be a nightmare to do. So we're gonna approximate this with the normal. In order to approximate this with the normal, we need to know is, NP and NQ, are these guys greater than five? So to work out NP, we got 500 times 0.3, I have 150. So yeah, that guy's greater than five. Check mark, we're good. NQ, we're gonna have 500 times 0.7, well, we're gonna have 350. So again, 350, Check, we're good there. We can approximate this binomial distribution with the normal. So that being said, let's take a look at this idea of a normal. So we have our distribution, roughly right best we can do, symmetrical, 
falling off on both sides, asymptotic to the x-axis. We're going to have our mean. Keep in mind this mean is going to be pulled from our binomial. So mean of a binomial is n times p. Mean of a binomial n times p. So that's going to be 150. Standard deviation. Well, my standard deviation, that's going to come from the binomial. And that's going to be the square root of n times p times q. So in that case there, we're going to have 10 point, uh, 10 point, we'll go 247. We'll keep an extra decimal place going around there. 10.247. Okay, now what are we looking for? We are looking for the probability that more than 140 of these Canadians have a debt to disposable income of over 200. So, okay, our mean is 150. We want probability of 140. Now, oh, let's make that a straight line. Probability of witnessing 140 or more, right? We're looking for all of this. Okay, but keep in mind, we are approximating the binomial. We are approximating a discrete. So your temptation is to go 140 and convert that to a Z. But no, 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 we can't do that, right? We need to do that whole problem where if we did 140, it wouldn't encompass the entire box. So we need to do this whole plus or minus 0.5, depending on whether or not we want to actually include this number. So what we're actually going to be working out in this case, because we want more than 140, so 141, 142, we want the probability that x is greater than 140.5. We would have to add 0.5 to this. So let's work through that. 140.5. So okay, with that in mind, we now need to transform our x into a z and that 140.5 we can work that out z equals variable of interest so 140.5 minus our average 150 all over my standard deviation 10.247 so okay what do i get 140.5 minus 150 that's negative 9.5 divided by 10.247, I'm gonna get a Z score of negative 0.93. Now keep in mind, it's actually 927, but our Z table only goes to two decimal places, so we're gonna to go to two decimal places. So negative 0.93. Pulling down our mean, that's zero. We're going to look up on our table the probability of witnessing some value between the z score we looked up and the mean. So let's jump over and take a look at that. Keep in mind, again, a warning as I do this. This is going to get really bright all of a sudden because I'm going to go into a white screen. Okay, so here we have our z table from the textbook again. That is again. End of the table of contents, last chapter 13, statistical tables. You then want to scroll down to find the standard normal probability distribution or Z table. From here, we want to look up our Z statistic. So we had 0 0.93. So we're going to go down the left hand side. We get 0 0.9, 0 0.90, 0 0.91, 0.92, 0.93. So that guy right there. We'll highlight it in yellow just to make it easy for us to find. That's 0.3238. So 0.3238, let's go and take a look at that guy. So 32.38% chance we fell in this zone. So altogether, what is the area we're looking for? Well, we're looking for this green zone. So we have just this bit, all right, just this white shaded bit as 3238. How do we get all the rest? 
Well, keep in mind, symmetric distribution, the entire thing sums to one. So this half, this half over here is 50%. So our whole together probability, our whole together probability of pulling out more than 140 Canadians with debt to disposable incomes of over 200% will be 32.38% plus 50%. So 0 0.5 plus 0 0.3238, that's going to be 82.38, or we would get a 82.38% chance. And we have our result. So if we surveyed 500 Canadians at random and we wanted to know what the likelihood was of getting more than 140 with debt to disposable incomes over that percentage, well, it's very likely we'd get that result. We would have an 82.38% chance of having more than 140 with that high debt to disposable income. So we worked through that example. Let's work through our last one then. In this case here, so we have a large city and one in 10 fire hydrants are in need of repair. So, okay, probability that a fire hydrant needs repair is one in 10, so 10%. A fire crew examines 100 hydrants in a week. I'm going to assume that's my sample size. And we want to know, hey, what is the probability that they will find nine or fewer fire hydrants in need of repair? So we want X that is less than or equal to nine right so fewer than nine nine or fewer that need repair so okay that's nine eight seven six all the way down to zero right so okay again this could be done using just strictly binomial right again that was kind of our first thing is this a discrete or a continuous thing i jumped in with that i said hey number of fire hydrants that's discrete right i can't have 1.2 fire hydrants i have to have a whole number so discrete Everything else for the question was really leading down this binomial path. So it seems like a binomial question. My kind of hint that I'd want to do this using the normal approximation is my large number of n, my, my large number of trials, right? This here and then working out x of less than or equal to 9 would be a lot of work. But I can go about it using my normal approximation and make things a bit easier for me. But I need to make sure I can. I need to have my assumption that NP, NQ, that these guys are greater than 5. So, okay, first one, NP, 100 times 0.1. Well, that's going to give me 10. So, yep, yeah, that guy's greater than 5. And then NQ, so that's going to be 100 times 0.9. That'll give me 90. So, again, that guy's greater than 5. I'm good to go with my normal approximation. Normal approximation then, we have X, which is our number of hydrants, right? Number of hydrants in need of repair, technically, if we really wanted to get into that. And I'm going to have my normal distribution centered around the mean. Where do I get that value of the mean from? Well, I get that value of the mean from the binomial. So again, the mu of a binomial is N times P. The standard deviation of a binomial is n times p times q. So going back through n times p, that's 10. My standard deviation then, that's going to be 3. Okay, in this case, what am I asking? I want to know what's the probability of having nine or fewer so okay where does nine fall in nine should fall in somewhere around there but let's keep in mind when counting through these i want to include nine right so i want actually the nine i want eight i want on and on and on so using my continuity correction factor i'm going to want to solve for probability that x is less than 9.5 because I'm going to want to include that box that has the 9 in it. So 9.5 is what I'm going to utilize here with that continuity correction factor. Can't do anything with the x's. I need to transform the x's into z values. That 10 will drop down to be a 0. 
I need to find out what 9.5 is. So 9.5, we have our random variable of interest minus our mean all over our standard deviation. So that's going to give me 0 0.5 over 3. Ah, that's going to, not going to be that big. 0 0.5 over 3, that's going to be 0 0.17, right? And again, it's 1666666. Our Z table only goes to two decimal places, so 0 0.17. Final thing, a little sloppy here, that's negative 0.5, so negative 0 0.17. If I need to look up my probability, keeping in mind my probability that I look up on my table is between my value and zero. Going to my table then, 0 0.1 across to seven gives me 6.75, zero. So there's a 6.75% chance I fall between 9.5 and 10. Not what I'm interested though. Right, what I'm interested in was probability that we have nine or fewer. I want this green area. So to get that, keeping in mind that from zero all the way to negative infinity is 50%. Well, if I'm there all the way to negative infinity is 50% and that little bit is 6.75, well then my leftover, my leftover is going to be 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0675, which will give me a 43.25% chance. So 0.4325. That is my likelihood, my probability that I have fewer than nine, sorry, nine or fewer fire hydrants in need of repair. A 43.25% chance. Okay, so hopefully that helped in going through. As we continue on with this chapter, it becomes a little deceiving as we go through all your practice questions, right? As we go through the quizzes, as we go through this, they're always, they tend to be structured together such that it's, here's a bunch of questions about the normal. Here's a bunch of questions of the normal approximation of the binomial. The problem is, is that come an exam situation, I'm never going to be telling you which one it is. I will be giving you the instructions, just like the questions from the test, or in your quiz rather, but they're not going to be grouped together in the same kind of way. You could have a normal question followed by a normal approximation question. You have to discern from the question information given to you which tool to utilize. Are you just going to go straight through the normal route? Or do you have to go and find out what the mean is? Do you have to find out what the standard deviation is? Do you have to make sure you can even do that by making sure that your NP and Q are greater than five? And then do you need to apply your continuity correction factor? All right, so you have to discern from the question which world you're dealing with. And right, you're dealing with the normal if you're strictly dealing with continuous data. You're dealing with the normal approximation if you're dealing with discrete data. So again, the difference, discrete data is counted, continuous data is measured. So one of the ways that you can kind of keep those separated. Bit of a difference for each one, but important that you can Distinguish between the two and not just fall into the trap of, oh, I'm doing the normal now, do, 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 do. oh, I'm doing the normal approximation now. Because then come midterm time, when all of a sudden I just give you the questions back to back, mingled in with other ones, you're going to go, oh my goodness, I have no idea which one I use in this scenario. So biggest tool for you to figure out. That does us for a normal approximation though. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me. Feel free to post to the D2L discussion board. Otherwise, we'll take a look at this. Everything for the rest of the semester is to do with the normal. So we'll take a look at this farther in next week.